Bandwidth for VT Talk is provided by vaporworld.co.uk. Hello, I didn't see you over there. It's Wednesday night. It's nine o'clock. That means it must be VT Talk. And tonight, tonight, it's an unholy threesome. Well, at least that's what they say. As you will see, live from his studio in downtown Barnsley, we have Mark Green, otherwise known as Mark Van Basten, and to his left, and to my far left, right the way over there, all the way over there, the effervescent, beauteous loveliness that is the one and only Sav. Mm -hmm. If you've never met her, you wouldn't know. But she is fizzy and bubbly, aren't you, Sav? Absolutely. I'll tell you what we'll do. Shall we play the titles in? And then when we've played the titles, I'm going to take the mickey out of Marco. It's what you do, you know. Here we go. <laughs> It's all right now, but we started mid-sentence. All right, fair enough. Um, apparently, there's been a, a challenge or two on the 360p channel, 480 and 720 remain unaffected. We do apologise for that. It's out with our control. Um, weather, I don't know. It'll be something like that. Anyway, we've got all kinds for you tonight. Um, and yes, that thing from Channel 4, we've got that. And yes, we've got the EU thing as well. And yet we've got all sorts of stuff. But before we get into that, I just wanted to have a quick word with Mark Warren. First of all, say congratulations on your on your pilot, your debut episode last night, Mark. Well done. Thank you very much, Dave. It was um, a bit intense, my end, but uh, I've, I've watched it back. It looked OK. By, by intense, you mean what? Your backside going like a bunny's nose? <laughs> no, it wasn't a bottom side. <laughs> I just had this terrible indigestion all day. But uh, yeah, it was uh, it was good. I enjoyed it. Excellent. Well, I shall look forward to seeing more of uh, pretty much the same. It was it was buff 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 buff, fast and snappy, good stuff. And I particularly enjoyed the interview with Mr. Basado, and I'm sure he did too. Um, if you've missed it, folks, it's on video on demand. It's on the podcast. It's on YouTube. It's everywhere you look because we profligate we are. Major right. horse, I believe, is the phrase, isn't it, Sav? That's exactly it, yes. I presume there'll be one or two comments from chat about last night's show? Yes, there's comments coming in saying, great first show, well done, really enjoyed it. Um, all positive, all good. There you go. I'm not going to mention the little message I sent to Mark Rowe last night when he said he'd been sat with his wife watching it. <laughs> no. But we know, don't we, children? <laughs> yes, we do. Yes. Not mentioning celebrity sex, no. We won't do that. Shall we get into the serious issues, Do you, What? <laughs> Did I see a shake of the head there, Sav? Yes, you might have done, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I think we probably do need to get into the, uh, into the serious issues. I was forewarned this morning that there was going to be a piece on Channel 4 News tonight about e-cigs. And uh, I tweeted as much, and anybody that follows me on Twitter will have seen that going out. And anybody that follows Jerry Stimson will also have seen it going out. Um, so if you tuned in, I'm sorry, I'm about to play it in now. If you missed it, then, yeah, I'll just play it, shall I? Hi. Hi. Here we go. Now, if you're trying to give up smoking, how about reaching for... They're increasingly popular, but the jury's out on whether they actually work. Health watchdogs Looks are about like to publish more draft than half guidance an hour. on nicotine replacement products, which include e-cigs. The number of people using them is rising, but the market is, at the moment, entirely unregulated. Our health and social care correspondent, Victoria MacDonald, reports. This month, in case you missed it, is Stoptober. A £6 million government campaign to persuade people to give up smoking. But even as the ads are running, a new tactic is also being discussed. An acknowledgement, if you like, that some people just don't want to or can't stop smoking. 
Now the National Institute of Health and Clinical Excellence is preparing guidance not on how to stop people smoking, but on how to reduce the harm that tobacco does them. And one of the aspects that they're looking at is these, e-cigarettes. They are a form of nicotine replacement and increasingly popular. The latest figures show that by next year, one million people will be using them. The shop and rugby opened in January and its owner claims 130 people come through the door each week. Probably the conversion rate from footfall is probably 98% of people who come in actually buy once they've tried it. It's, it's so, the experience is so close to smoking. Without smoking, you won't get any closer. None of the other products, patches, inhalers, none of the products give you that sensation. Certainly in the time we were there, more than a dozen people came in, choosing their flavours from champagne to strawberry. Tell me why you want to stop smoking. Because it kills you. <laughs> <laughs> and I've got asthma, <laughs> so I need to stop. Well, I wanted to cut down on cigarettes to start with, because of my chest, which it has helped. Uh, and then the money saved is a hell of a lot. How much do you think? I reckon about six, five to six hundred pounds in three months. NICE is in fact looking at a variety of methods of harm reduction based on the fact nicotine might be addictive but it does not cause cancer. However, anti-smoking organisations are concerned that e-cigarettes are unregulated. And next year, the MHRA, which licences medicines, has agreed to look at this. Users of e-cigarette smokers have a right to know how much nicotine they're going to be getting, uh, whether they're going to be getting enough, whether one is going to be stronger than another. And at the moment, you know, these products are largely unregulated. They're coming in from all around the world. Um, people don't know what they're getting. And the evidence on how effective products like e-cigarettes are on helping people quit for good is not yet there. But Professor Jerry Stimpson, an expert in harm reduction, is persuaded. The scenario for the five or ten years ahead is go down to your corner shop or, you know, these things should be on display and available. They should be more prominent than any tobacco product, easier to get than any tobacco product in my view. But even if agreement can't be reached on the regulation of products like e-cigarettes, it would be difficult to persuade these customers that they should just stop. Many have tried that and it didn't work. So there you go. That was the piece that went out on Channel 4. Marco, was that the first time you've seen it? No, I watched it earlier on, Dave, um, about 25 minutes ago. Yeah, interesting piece. What do you make of it? It depends on what NICE end up coming back with. Um, you know, the whole tobacco harm reduction against, as opposed to, getting people to completely stop using nicotine. I think maybe they're getting a message that people, some of them don't want to give up nicotine. You know, we don't want to give up nicotine, we quite like it. Um, what we do want to do is to get that nicotine in a safer, a safer way. Uh, and as soon as people really get that side of it, then the better really. Yeah, what, one of the things that, that I picked up in that piece, and I've only watched it twice myself, one of the first things she said was, it's a form of nicotine replacement therapy. And it, it's kind of, you have to wonder sometimes whether these people are actually doing their homework. But that said, what effect do you think that's going to have on the general public? I would hope that getting more information out there will take away this misconception that, you know, we are smoking and we're doing it illegally. Um, you know, we go back to the rat list thing at the weekend. Um, people don't understand it and they don't get it yet. Once they do, and once it's more widely accepted and more widely um, out there, then I think the, the general public will understand it a little bit more, not just the people who vape. Indeed, I think you're right, yes. I should point out as well that Jerry Stimson, the guy that was on at the end of that piece, um, has agreed to come onto the show. Now, his background is in harm reduction and in harm reduction, not in tobacco control, which is an entirely different kettle of fish in my view. Um, so we're looking to be having him on the week of November the 5th, actually, is what we're looking at. I'm just trying to get it all set up. Um, 
my emails talking to his email and our Skypes are busily into England and, and we'll we'll try and get that together for week beginning November the, November the 5th so it'll be November the 7th I think. So are we getting much in from chat? Yes, we've got quite a few comments from chat. Uh, Gary Wood says, why do they keep referring to E6 as a way to quit? Uh, Russell Orders said, they're not entirely unregulated. Marky Mar says, oh, and the government knows how much we're supposed to be getting regarding the nicotine. Um, that kit the couple of comments on those lines Gary Wood said I never looked at the milligrams on the side of a box of cigarettes so I never knew how much I was getting anyway Jeff Benny in his head how effective they are who cares they are less harmful and if people want to buy them then shut up and go back to building your duck pond and claiming it on expenses <laughs> uh, Moonlit has said well effective at what if it's effective at using less cigarettes then anecdotally it works for me and Jeff Benny and says we need to get Naked News doing a positive article on E6. Ah, uh, yes, the Naked News, yes, yes. I, I would, I would, I would go to, I would, yes, the Naked News, yes. Let's not go there, let's not get, because <laughs> uh, I can get to the gutter too easily. We all know that too well. So, the first three points that you read out there, you haven't deleted them, have you? No, I haven't deleted them. Can we take them one by one? Because there's some interesting points, and if there are people watching the show, either live or after the fact, video on demand and YouTube and everything else. I would like to expand on those a little bit if I can. So what was the yeah. first one? The first one was from Gary Wood and he said, why do they keep referring to e-cigs as a way to quit? Yes. It would appear that the influence of our American cousins has floated across the Atlantic. And what we are seeing is a situation where folks are confusing tobacco harm reduction and smoking cessation. What they see is that they have quit using tobacco and therefore that they have quit. The World Health Organization, the MHRA and the EU see the term quit as meaning smoking cessation. They do not understand at this point in time the notion of quitting using tobacco and that therefore being the best, the most effective form of tobacco harm reduction as far as continuing nicotine use is concerned. Um, I've been trying to get my head around this for a while. Marco, what's your take on it? Yeah, that that whole think, quit. There is confusion, I guess. People still think that we're using e-cigs because we want to stop smoking. That's not the case, is it? We, we're using e-cigs because we want to enjoy the nicotine in a different form. That's all it is. But people are confused. And, you know, I get asked the question by people all the time. Are you going to stop vaping? Um, are you doing this to stop smoking? No, I'm not going to stop vaping because I really like it. Um, and I'm quite involved, as you all know. Um, so... I, I use e-cigs so I can get the nicotine that I was getting from my roll-ups. Um, I'm just not getting all the other things. Exactly. I mean, donkeys ages ago, I characterised it as being all of the joys and none of the death of smoking. Um, it is a means to continue what you were doing with tobacco, but with a much, much reduced risk profile. And it's why... I know I keep getting people's backs up when I say that I haven't stopped smoking. It's because I don't see the term smoking as meaning lighting tobacco and inhaling it. It's nicotine use. And if, if it had been called finagling, I had this conversation on Saturday. Um, if, if we'd called the, the action of lighting a tab or smoking a pipe, sorry, sucking on a lit pipe or sucking on a cigar, finagling for want of a term, would still be finagling. It was only called smoking because people weren't really clued up on other terms. They couldn't find another word for it. The same as we haven't been able to find anything to replace the word vaping, a word I don't like. And I make no bones about it. It means something entirely different to me. But yes, um, and you'll see a little bit later on as we move on, why I kind of still feel that solidarity with cigarette users. We're all nicotine users, but you'll see why pardon me, a little bit later on. So that's the first one, just to, to kind of lay the groundwork for that. The second point you brought up, Sav? 
The second point I've got about um, they're not entirely unregulated, is that the one you want, or is it the nicotine levels? Uh, well, I'll probably end up taking the two of them together, actually. Um, no problem. Nicotine levels, kind of, there is regulation about nicotine out there, and most people on the forums, I was just reading a conversation on All About Today, uh, where somebody was asking about bringing nicotine in from abroad. Um, from a site that actually does 100 milligram juice and they were informed politely but in no uncertain terms that there is a regulation you cannot legally possess greater than 75 milligram nicotine 7.5 percent legally if you've got 76 smack back of risk you're breaking the law so you can't legally get 100 percent now if there's a regulation that means it's regulated has to. In terms of juices that are out there, there are regulations in place. There are the chip regulations. That means the childproof um, packaging, you know, it's supposed to be childproof lids. It's supposed to have uh, the little warning triangle on the side. Mine's still on there, just. That's for if you can't see, so you can feel that there's a warning triangle. And there's supposed to be all sorts of other little signs and symbols all over the labels and stuff like that. And I would say in 95 cases out of 100, the vendors out there I'd hate to all of that. There are one or two that don't, still. Um, but in the UK, I would say 95 times out of 100 or more, people I'd hate to that. There are regulations that govern how it can be packaged. So how they can say it's almost completely unregulated, again, is totally beyond me. It is regulated. There are actually CE regulations for um, the batteries. Uh, there are, uh, what's it called? Wee regulations for, for, for batteries. There's all kinds of regulation in place. And in fact, e-cigs are regulated as a general sales product already. There's loads of regulation in place. Um, but when it comes to knowing the amount of nicotine you get, that's something I want to look at in another program in a little bit more depth. But since the Box Elder palaver, um, I think certainly the bigger vendors, the bigger mixers, uh, the likes of your Decade and Vapors and, and, and so on and so forth, have all made absolutely certain, and it's not just them, it's, it's the majority of them, have made absolutely certain that they know exactly what's going into juice. And as I say, next week, we're going to be uh, having a natter with some of the guys from, I wish it was a better name, but AIMSA, the uh, American e-juice manufacturers and suppliers trade association. AIMS, it's a rotten one to pronounce. Why they couldn't have called it something simple like juice, I don't know, but never mind. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to having a, a natter with them about that. Um, but yes, there's regulation in place. I mean, you knew there was regulation in place, didn't you, Mark? Oh, I did indeed, Dave. Um, and you're right, some suppliers um, from overseas aren't really adhering to everything that we do in the UK. Um, you go to the main suppliers over here, you get in the skull and crossbones, you get in the over 18 sign, you get in the little plastic triangle stuck on the top, uh, and you get in the childproof tops. Um, obviously, that doesn't, that doesn't happen with people who sell outside those regulations. Well, yes, I mean, if you buy stuff from America, they go with the American regulations, and the American regulations don't require any of that. But specifically with regard to UK, UK vendors all, to my knowledge, I've not yet met one that doesn't uh, adhere to uh, the chip regulations. And I've not yet met one that's flogging 76 milligram juice or higher. In fact, to my knowledge, they all stop at 72 so there's that little bit of leeway in case they get the titration slightly wrong. And that's not... Um, I don't think to to, uh, to watch their own backs. It actually looks after you because it's the likes of me and Marco and Sav and everybody watching this. It's illegal for us to have it, and it's quite. It could be quite legal. Well, it's legal, obviously, uh, for for juice manufacturers who are licensed to hold higher concentrations. Um, they can. They've got a license that can do that. So it actually looks after our best interests because if they did get it wrong, you give us seventy six. And you've got a jobs worth coming along with the 
I'm sorry, I have to test your nicotine liquid and make sure it's not ever 7 I'm afraid it's 76. I'm going to look you up for the rest of your natural life. They're looking after us in that respect. So if they get it wrong, we'll go to 73, not 76. Um, I can see the eyeballs are flitting, Sav. I'm just sort of, um, there's a lot of comments coming in about um, how different it is with the American liquid. And Marky Mar has said, who's in America, our liquid doesn't have all those things on it. They don't even require childproof caps. So that's going to be interesting for next week. Yes, I'm quite looking forward to that. Although it has to be, so you've caught me just while I'm filling my glass up. Um, <laughs> I blame Dave Kitson. Um, I do. It's, but it's Diet Coke. Is it? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, Coke extra. Um, yes, I mean, the you know, the, the, the child safety regulations, the chip regulations, all of that. I mean, I'd, if, I've, if I have to be honest, and I have, um, the minute the bottle gets in, the child-proof calf gets chucked. Well, you're not a child, so... No, it, it's, it's and we, do, we don't have any childs. Mm -hmm. um, and I can't open them things. Well, that's the problem. I cannot either. And it's so, no, they just get chucked straight away. They always mm -hmm. used to on the glass bottles from DV and from TW. Always get them straight off and get the droppers in. Mm -hmm. Or pour it into a plastic bottle. But anyway, yeah. all of that is there. So they can't really say that there's no regulation. Um, because there's loads of regulation. But apparently, they want more. So just when I thought we'd got shot of some, which we'll talk about after the adverts, here's another one coming in. I wasn't expecting nice getting stuck in at this point in time. Is anybody seeing, I mean, I'm not a great one for conspiracy theories, but is anybody seeing kind of a slippery slope here? <laughs> Mark? Well, nice are a strange, a strange bunch. Um, you know, they'll recommend one drug for one person, but the same drug for a different person, uh, or not the same drug for a different person because they've got a different disease. Um, and I'm, I, I'm actually a victim of that because I suffer from arthritis and I have a drug and it's not approved by NICE. Um, and it's actually being provided to me by the manufacturer until it is approved by NICE. So they are a bit of a strange department, I must say. So are you using drugs illicitly? Good Not on illicitly. you, son. Hey, what? <laughs> Not illicitly, but, you know, the stuff that I use, it, it costs like £12,000 a year. And NICE aren't wanting to, to use that. Um, and there's lots of people out there who can't get that particular drug. Um, so I'm fortunate. I was in a, a, a clinical trial some years ago. Um, and because of that, and because of my interaction with that clinical trial, the manufacturers themselves fund my um, arthritis medication. And if it wasn't for that, then, you know, could I work? Possibly not. Uh, it's, you know, it completely changed um, the way the disease was affecting me. And there's so many people out there that don't get that and they're in a much worse position. And NICE, you know, they hold the purse strings and they make a lot of good and bad decisions. And I think we need to be mindful of how they act with the nicotine. I think I'm going to pick that up after the uh, after the first ad break because there's something you've just said that I would like to follow up with everybody's kind of indulgence and permission. There's something in that that I would like to follow up and we'll follow it up right after this. Vaporworld.co.uk sponsors conversation on VT Talk. Because you want one. 
I Weber and I Weber Alexa, best in Yorkshire for your AC needs. That's I Weber.co.uk and I Weber-Alexa.co.uk. I Weber and I Weber-Alexa.co.uk are proud sponsors of WeberTrails.tv. And now back to conversation on VT Talk, sponsored by Vaporworld.co.uk. And we're back in the room. And just, just a quick follow-up before we move on. Marco, how long ago were you on the clinical trial? I did a double-blind clinical trial for six months uh, where I, neither the hospital nor myself uh, knew what the drug was, whether it was a placebo or not, and that was eight years ago. Uh, after that, I had six months with the drug, the actual drug, uh, and then a decision was made whether or not they were going to fund the £12,000 a year, and it was basically no. Right. So the makers actually fund it, and they've been doing it for the past eight years. Well, the, the question I've got is, when that drug was trialled, how long did it take for it to get the marketing authorizations for the conditions that it does have authority for? That I can't tell you. Um, I do know that it is used in rheumatoid arthritis and it's also um, prescribed for psoriasis. But I've got something called psoriatic arthritis, which is a bit of both, and it's not covered at all under those regulations. So the other two, you get it, but if you've got the mixture of the both, then you don't. Right. The reason I asked was uh, to find out how long these clinical trials and marketing authorization processes actually take because as we know IntelliSig is already going for marketing authorization for their ASIGs as NRT as opposed to THR um, and I'm just kind of wondering if if the worst happens and NICE says it ought to be a medicine and the MHRA says it ought to be a medicine and the WHO says it ought to be a medicine that's kind of three areas EU will do within a minute um, if they all say that, and then what are they going to do? Take them off the market while the clinical trials are on? That was that was the only reason I wanted to go down that route. So I just wondered if you knew when the the drug had actually hit the market. No, I, I don't know when um, when it did. Um, the arrangement I had with the uh, the hospital up in Leeds, and I saw the top consultant in the country, uh, who's the top rheumatologist, uh, and they they said you just can't get it. You know, oh, well. we can't prescribe it to you because I inject every two weeks under the skin with this in, this injection, uh, and it's five hundred pounds every single one. So I'm so lucky that the manufacturers, you know, supply it for free. If it wasn't the case, I may not get it. Um, and the amount of people out there that probably don't get it, uh, and whose condition gets worse and worse. I mean, I've had arthritis now for twenty years, um, and uh, when I was 34, I couldn't even tie my shoelaces or do a button-up. I couldn't open a bottle of pop. Good it was grief. that bad. Well, given that it's 500 quid a pop and you're going through two a month, we're changing your name from Mark or Van Basten <laughs> to Ronnie Wood. <laughs> it's good stuff. It really is good stuff. I'll try it to my life completely. <laughs> yes, right. Um, I think we probably need to blast on, really. Uh, we, we may not get through everything I wanted to look at, and I'm now trying to juggle which are the bits that I want to look at next, because there's two quite important bits coming off. Um, but first, we'll take any comments that we've had from chat, and I'm sure there'll have been a few, so. There's been quite a few, mainly along the, the same lines. I mean, the chat I currently fixated on childproof bottle tops, which I won't go down. <laughs> but um, a comment came in earlier from MG Jones regarding um, the stop and smoking. And he said, we use e-cigs because we don't want to stop smoking. And a comment from Russell Ord who's saying, vaping e-smoking is a way to take control of our smoking. And that was the gist of what chat we're coming out with. And as I say, the bottle tops, I'll leave them to it with that. Yeah, you're probably wise. You're probably wise. But yes, 
I'm in total agreement with uh, with Russell and with Mark. Uh, this is a way for me to continue my habit without the death and mm -hmm. without getting kicked out of places. Although <laughs> I have to say on Saturday, it didn't quite work out that way. And let me explain. Um, if you saw Dave Kitson show on Sunday, dear viewer, you would know that the North East East Smokers Knees Up uh, took place then at a place called the Rattler. There's a, actually there's a review on uh, on what do you call the thing again? Uh, TripAdvisor. Trip Trip, uh, there's a review on TripAdvisor where it says, "I attended an event, should say an event, as a participant yesterday." For those who don't know, it was a meet-up of around 30 folks from all over the country to discuss electronic cigarettes, try various different ones, and so forth. Our host, not our host, had booked this venue months ago, and because e-cigs are quite new and relatively unknown, was at pains to point out what they were, what we'd be doing, and so forth. The management were quite happy with it all, and so we attended, really looking forward to a grand day, meeting at 3 and going on through until 11 o'clock. Imagine our surprise and disgust when 90 minutes or so into the event, the manager appeared and told us that, contrary to what we had contracted with the venue, we were not going to be allowed to continue what we were doing, but were also going to be turfed out of the place at 6.30 because they'd booked the room to uh, an, as it turns out, fictitious 21st birthday party from 7.30. Suffice it to say that we immediately sought another venue and decanted to the sundial, a hundred yards up the road, a venue which welcomed us with open arms and treated us right royally. Moreover, this sorry excuse for an establishment lost close to a grand in revenue because the manager either did not understand that electronic cigarettes are perfectly legal to use indoors or has no idea what a contract is and bottled it when someone asked what was going on in the conservatory, which, by the way, was completely separable from the rest of the building and therefore need have had no effect on the rest of his patrons, which were few. Just to add insult to injury, one of our party returned to his vehicle parked in the Rattler Pay and Display car park, actually a council one, at around nine o'clock and there was no 21st birthday party going on. That was me venting a little bit um, on TripAdvisor. But, ha, would you believe on Facebook, the Rattler came back and said, the management and staff of the Rattler South Shields would like to issue an apology to those affected, it's affected, huh, by an incident on the 13th of the 10th, 2012. In order to maintain a level of customer service, there are a large number of factors that all contribute to a pleasurable experience for our guests. Our aim has and always will be to provide for the needs of our customers. Sometimes, however, we get it wrong. We understand that a group of people left our premises on Saturday 13, 10, 12, feeling that we may have let them down. May have! <laughs> Excuse me. While we strive to let all of our staff know about specific events and the needs of our customers, on this occasion there's been a lapse in communication from head office to the venue. This resulted in the staff being unaware of the exact requirements of a booking. We are sorry that the said booking was unable to continue their custom with us. Had the staff on duty had the correct information earlier and that correct questions had been asked in further communication, we would have been better suited to accommodate the somewhat unique requirements that the booking needed. In summary, we apologise to the group in question that we could not fulfil the requirements on the day and as a result we will be investigating as to why the correct information was not delivered. Now, see that lady all the way over there? Sav. <laughs> Sav was intimately involved with the bookage of said event, were you not, my dear? Uh, I certainly was. I uh, certainly was indeed. And am I right in thinking that a certain dark-haired young lady... Oh, Mark's gone. That a certain yes, Mark's lost his video. Ah, right. That a certain dark-haired young lady that was stood slightly to the right of the manager while the video was being taken of him having his little rant was the young lady with whom you had been having all the, de uh, the dealings. Yes, that was correct. So am I right in thinking that they actually had all the information that they needed? They had every bit of information they need and I never once spoke to anybody at head office. All the arrangements were done with the venue. Right. Now, there's a lesson to be learned here, I think. 
And one of those lessons that needs to be learned is if you're going to be organising something like this, be aware that no matter what we say on here, and we all know that it's legal and everything else, there are people who are running these establishments that really don't have a clue. And to a large degree, it's not their fault. Hopefully, following Channel 4's news piece, they will have a clue. They should have more of a clue. And if NICE gets it right, they'll have a brilliant clue. And indeed, there should be no issue ever again if NICE get it right. One can but hope. But until, until then, to be on the safe side, I would strongly suggest that you at least email, if not write, to any venue where you know you're going to be having some kind of a, well, a knees up, an e-cig event. Make sure it's in writing. Make sure that the people that you're talking to understand. Go and visit. Now, I'm saying this, and I know that the prime organiser went and visited on the mm -hmm. 30th of July, because strangely enough, the man is a Facebook junkie. So he checked in on Facebook at the Rattler. Hey, on the 30th of July. There's a timestamp on it. It's on the Rattler's page. <laughs> they can't yep. avoid it. He was there. And he had his e-cig with him. And he was giving it hot licks. So they knew. The bottom line on it is the manager bottled it. His bottle and glass went. I believe that's rhyming slang, isn't it? I believe it is, yes. Has chat got anything to say about this, per chance? Um... <laughs> I agree completely with what Midge Dog said. So he, and he says, so completely not self's fault. None of us doubted it at all, which I totally agree with. Um, Viking Vapor said, yes, when in doubt, blame the boss. Um, Jimbo UK saying, what questions needed to be asked? Um, again, Andy Bell, who was also at the the venue saying well done to the sundial who accommodated us so nicely which yes they certainly did um and gary i won't read the last comment that he typed in but it was very similar to one that was aired on dave kitson's show right yes we'll yes. not go there mm, i think no. i think i'm going to take it that we've lost mark for the time being i can hear sound but we've got no video yeah i've lost my video what are you doing you haven't stuck your foot through the camera have you no, I mean, Wirecast has died. <laughs> oh, well, just come in with your webcam. I will do, if I can get it to work. Yes. So, comment, just come into chat here. Russell is saying, on the back of this problem, it seems that the EAVM has been cancelled. I'm guessing that's uh, another local meet. I would definitely say don't cancel a meeting on the back of that problem at all, because that was something totally unexpected. Just double check. Make sure the venue that you're talking to understands completely get everything in writing and bring that writing with you absolutely eavm would be uh, the east anglian the me. east anglia yeah which i can't remember exactly where that was going to be but uh, no seriously honestly truthfully don't 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 russell is it the organizers that have cancelled or is it the venue that's cancelled off the back of this can you clatter into chat and let us know because Frankly, if I need to get involved, I will. Mm -hmm. I'm in the mood for it. Wonder mm. why. <laughs> Apparently, it's through Jimbo UK saying it's through lack of interest, not necessarily through people being wary. Um, All right, fair enough. Fair enough. If it's, well, if, it's we'll see. if it's lack of interest, that's one thing. A lot. Trust me. If Saturday night was anything to go by, you'd have a wheel of a time. Absolutely. Because we did. It was lush Brilliant in the sundial. Night. It really was lush in the sundial. Welcome <laughs> back, Mark. Hello, I'm back on my other camera, uh, which is even worse than the other one. But uh, there you go. Well, never mind. Hey, look at hey, we match. Look, look, <laughs> red and green, <laughs> twins separated at birth. <laughs> it's just a shame he's got the handlebar down on. You know, it's. Uh, you see, yeah, I've got my, I've got my Bradleys, yeah. Yeah, well, Mr. Wiggins has got a lot to answer for, I think. I'm going um, to have to clip us out by next week. Shall we, uh, shall we take a quick ad break and then blast on? Yeah. Because yeah. I've just seen what the time is. It's unbelievable how quick these shows go. We'll be back in a couple of minutes, and then it's kind of good news and bad news. Good news for us, bad news for the EU. That's nice.
Vaporworld.co.uk sponsors conversation on VT Talk. And now back to conversation on VT Talk, sponsored by Vaporworld.co.uk. And we're back in the room. Now, just in case you missed it, uh, I've just been asked to reiterate what nice is. And it's not just one of Santa's lists. I'm on the naughty one anyway. NICE is the National Institute for Clinical Excellence and what they do basically is tell the NHRA what to do. They deal with drugs, it's a, a kind of a super, supervisory and advisory body. Um, I hope that helps to kind of explain what that was all about. They're also um, very tightly involved with the EU. Seamless links are us tonight, I'm telling you. <laughs> um, and there was bad news for the EU today and possibly good news for us. If I just slip there, you probably got no idea who John Daly is. Not John Daly, different fella altogether. Um, he resigned today. John Daly is the, um, the commissioner in charge of the, uh, the new directive on tobacco control. And he resigned. And I'm going to play you the video of how he's announced his resignation and what's been going on. And listen very carefully because at one point he's going to tell you what's going to happen to the tobacco directive. Listen, um, uh, the company making the, uh, the uh, um, allegations uh, and filing the complaint is part of the tobacco lobby. We'll start from there. Um, it must also be said that... Uh, um, we are working and we on the new tobacco directive which will be making it um, much more stringent um, uh, for uh, tobacco companies uh, to, uh, to uh, uh, attack especially the young people to smoke and uh, that on, with which we are going to strengthen our regulations in Europe. Now this directive has been worked on for many, many, many months and we finalized the concepts of the directive at the end of February of this year. Now it should be noted that from information I received uh, recently, um, the uh, dealings that started between the tobacco lobby and this individual were in March. So it was after I had concluded my, my uh, um, uh, direction of policy to Sanko. After this conclusion, Sanko um, sent the impact assessment uh, to uh, the impact assessment board and we had to go pass through twice the test of this uh, impact assessment because it was not easy. But we passed two impact assessments and we were scheduled to uh, launch uh, the, what is called the inter-service um, on this directive in August. This was stopped by a letter from the Secretary General and the Legal Services and uh, it was postponed for further discussion. On what grounds did they postpone? Because they said that they needed further discussion. It uh, was again due to be launched early this month and again it was postponed. The next date for the launch was set to next Monday. 
Now, I'm not there, and the probability is that uh, the directive is, suspend, is in suspended animation. And if, it, if this is so, then it's going to mean that there will be no such directive during this commission. Uh, what exactly does this directive look at? Uh, what, what will be the impact to the consumer and to the industry? This directive basically looks at making cigarettes less attractive. And uh, we uh, specify regulation on the package itself um, uh, without going to the plain packaging that many people are talking about, but specifying that 75% uh, of the um, packet front and back should be dedicated to pictorials that show the damage done by tobacco. We were also um, uh, proposing regulation on flavorings of tobacco, which make uh, the, the tobacco attractive, the vanilla flavor, the strawberry flavor, the chocolate flavor, which are attracting a, long, a lot of young women um, to smoke. And a piece of statistics that we have, which is interesting, is while we're seeing the uh, um, percentage of smokers in general decrease in Europe, but in the sector of young females, it is increasing. And this is a very worrying, worrying indication indeed. So, uh, and then we will be making much more um, certainty in the non-tobacco products um, by uh, um, uh, making regulation of how new um, uh, tobacco products that are smokeless can come to the market and also on how to um, uh, regulate the, uh, these what are, are called um, electronic cigarettes, okay, by limiting the nicotine content of the cartridges that they should contain. Um, obviously, you, you, you kind of, um, uh, seem to be taking a lot of like, um, steps in a wide, bridge, uh, wide range of the industry. You just mentioned smokeless uh, flavored stuff. Mm -hmm. Who then uh, do you think, in your opinion, would sort of have the most to gain? You said that the, the legislation was in suspended animation. Who gains from you not being here now? No, again, the fact that this directive will not see the light of day is a big gain to the tobacco industry. Uh, surely the, the European citizens is not gaining from this. We have every year 700 people dying from tobacco and 2 million people getting a chronic disease due to smoking. In your statement, uh, you said you'll continue to work uh, on this very important piece of legislation. What are your plans for further action now? now I will continue uh, to work with my colleagues in college and also with uh, people who are very like-minded in Parliament and the health ministers in, in, uh, in the various member states. I know that many are uh, for um, uh, strengthening the, uh, the uh, regulations on tobacco and I will make them aware that it will be a pity if uh, all the work that has been done will go to waste. Yes, so there you go. That was the bloke that was driving through the tobacco directive in the EU who has resigned. He actually jumped before he was pushed. Um, I'm trying to remember when Catherine Devlin went across to the EU to have conversations with them about the tobacco directive when she was being consulted. I have the feeling it was after February and I've, I'm sure somebody will chat will, in chat will correct me if I'm wrong but apparently judging by what that bloke's just said by February 2012 it was a done deal and <coughs> you'll also have noticed that they've lumped e-cigs in with tobacco products. They're treating them as tobacco products um, and that there's going to be a limit on cartos no more juice just cartos that's what they were talking about but the good news good news yay he said the directive is in suspended animation it's unlikely to go ahead so there's a bit of a reprieve marco have you seen any of that before now yeah, and I've just been, uh, well, earlier on I was looking at the, uh, the timeline, uh, the, uh, the, the daily or daily OLAF investigation. 
uh, and it was uh, interesting reading. I don't know if you've uh, if you've going to touch on that or not. Well, I have read it through, yes, and apparently it was Swedish match that uh, blew the whistle on somebody uh, trying to make money out of set setting up a meeting. But apparently, um, if we're to believe what we've been told, it was a, a Maltese entrepreneur is how he's been described all over the place. Although Mr. Daly did name him in that interview, but because of the libel laws in the UK, we can't. Um, but allegedly, this uh, entrepreneur tried to set up the meeting and tried to extract money from um, Swedish Match in order to set it up. Um, but do carry on, do carry on. Yeah, I think it was Swedish Match and um, ECTOC, European Smokeless Tobacco Council. Yes. Um, alleg allegedly, of course. Allegedly. Because um, uh, uh, no, nothing was found against uh, Mr. Daly at all. Um, so uh, that's rather interesting. But it, uh, it does bring into question how long it's going to be or if it's going to remain in suspended animation permanently or if it will just die out. And I've got a feeling it might just die off. I would love to think you're right, but um, the, the anti-nicotine and tobacco zealots, ANTZ, this is something I've been picking up on the American forums, apparently it's a big term over there, ants. Um, are exactly that, anti-nicotine and tobacco zealots, are quite keen to see the back of, of, of e-cigs once and for all, and for one simple reason. I was just about to say, put that up. <laughs> yeah. It says it all for me. It really does. I mean, these people are just after controlling everybody else's life. But, yes, earlier on today, while all of this was happening, that there's been... It's been such a busy day. I mean, we're bang up to date with all of this. Um, the Channel 4 thing helps a lot. And I think, judging by the way it is reported, hopefully NICE is going to play NICE. It looks mm. as though the EU is going to be off our backs for a little while, at least. The World Health Organization can't really do anything probably before the summer of next year. They do tend to drag their feet a little bit. There's a lot of... Um, I forget what the word is, but, it, it, you know, it's a slow grind machine, is WHO. Uh, but although they do meet in November, and we'll find out what they've got to say then. So there's really MHRA to look forward to in May. And depending on what NICE says now in this new report that's going to come out, that will have a lot to do with what the MHRA says. And, but I'm really pleased that this tobacco directive is if Mr. Daly is to be believed, in suspended animation, it gives us a little bit of a reprieve. And again, mm -hmm. I can see the sav eyes flitting from side to side like a shuttlecock. The main question that's coming from chat is, do we have any idea how long a reprieve? Well, what he said was um, that it would be in the life of this commission. Now, I don't know when the next lot of elections are to the European Parliament. I can't remember off the top of my head, but I'm sure somebody in chat will know. Um, and, and I'm pretty sure that the Commission is kind of reconstituted at that point. So from now till the end of the current European Parliament, I think is probably how long it'll be reprieved for. And I just want to remind everybody what he said he was going to do. Watch this again. Um, by uh, um, uh, making regulation of how new um, uh, tobacco products that are smokeless can come to the market and also on how to um, uh, regulate the, uh, these what are, are called um, electronic cigarettes okay, by limiting the nicotine content of the cartridges that they should contain. That's the bit I wanted everybody to get. They're not just after fags, smokes, they're after e-cigs as well. Him and his ilk which was why I said last week, we've got, to, we've got to stand shoulder to shoulder. I don't, I really, you know, I don't smoke cigarettes because I don't like smoking cigarettes anymore. I much prefer the flavour out of e-cigs, but seriously, if we let them get the smokers, they'll get us as well. They're, all of these people have been lumping us together. It's only the folks that understand tobacco harm reduction and Lord bless us and save us. There's, fe there's very few of them that are in positions of power. But anyway, yes, um, suspended for the time being so there is some light at the end of the tunnel it's nearly worth a chair dance but not quite 
Anything else from Chatsov? Something's just come in from uh, Russell Lord who says, remember that the tobacco companies still have a big market out there in non-European countries. The WHO are more concerned about that than us. Forget about this bloke and his thing. He is history. Well, would that that was true. And I know why he's saying it. I, I really do. But during the course of my um, investigations today, um, there were a few statements put out by various different, I'll call them authorities, although I hesitate to give them that level of kudos, to be honest. But there's one, now I don't remember electing these people, but I want to show you something. This is, this is what they've put out. Look down at the bottom left hand side. Tob Taxi, making tobacco tax trendy. <laughs> Right? <laughs> and this is from the Smoke Free Partnership. And guess, guess who Smoke Free Partnership is consisting of? There it goes, the right hand side, it's just scrolling up now. It's a strategic, independent and flexible partnership between the European Respiratory Society. These were the ones that got the headlines about the damage to the lungs from acute inhalation of uh, nicotine containing products, i.e. e-cigs. Cancer Research UK, which as we know is also funded by Big Pharma. And the European Heart, Heart Network, which is also funded by Big Pharma. In other words, this lot is funded by Big Pharma and they are trying to make tobacco tax trendy. I'll put a link to this in the forums uh, up, up, up on forum.vapertrails.tv. Um, seriously, when you read through that document, it is going to scare the living daylights out of you. Not, a, I mean, it's just, there's no way that what, you read it, read it. Honestly, if your blood boils nearly as much as mine did when you read this document, um, you'll end up as red as Mark O's shirt. <laughs> you will. Have you seen that, Mark O? Sorry, say that bit again, Dave. Have you seen that document? I haven't seen that document, no. Well, let me tell you that it's been created as an integral component and one of the main deliverables of Tob Taxi, making tobacco tax trendy, a European Union funded capacity building project which ran from 2010 to 2012. It was organised to train the public health and tobacco control community in the intricacies of tobacco taxation and illicit trade at national and European level. How to get more money out of the smoker. That's what it's about. And I have to believe, given what uh, Mr. Darley was saying about the tobacco directive, that they would end up tagging e-cigs onto that little lot as well. People, we've got a fight on our hands. We really, really have. Um, I'll, I'll, we'll put the links up to that. Go and have a read of it. And it, it will. It'll scare the living daylights out of you. These people are just not concerned with our health at all. They are just trying to find any way they can to stop folks from enjoying a natural product. That leads into a lovely comment that Moonlight typed in who says, it makes no sense. If their concern really was disease caused by smoking, they'd be shouting from the rooftops about e-cigs. That alone should show them up as talking rubbish. And you know, we've got two minutes left. He's, he's exactly right. You are exactly right. There's enough scientific evidence out there now to show that electronic cigarettes are orders of magnitude safer to use than tobacco cigarettes. I, I still don't agree with people being shouted down for using tobacco cigarettes. It's their body, it's their choice. They can do what they like. But when it comes down to it, we know, we know that e-cigs would take a thousand years to do you as much harm as cigarettes would in a year, no matter how much you smoke. That's the way it goes. Um, and I don't think anybody can argue with that sensibly. But the bottom no, line... No, and it's time to roll your credits. Uh, I'm the, being shouted at. It's, it's there. The rolling... Go, the lad! Rolling. Um, so... We'll wind it up there. I hope people have found this useful. Marco, thank you so much for coming and joining us tonight. I hope you've well, enjoyed it. It's been marvellous as always, Dave. Goodly goodings. This is what we like to hear. Um, and we look forward to seeing you all 
well, tomorrow night for the Hayes Hour, and from Sunday night right the way through till Thursday next week. Till then, bye bye. Talk was sponsored by Vapor World, introducing the straight up range of e liquid from the USA containing real tobacco extracts. <laughs> <laughs>